our first song for tonight Jimmy the Swag giving us some good old gospel music back in the day let's see what else we got here get right into it first Thessalonians 5 19 and 20 
And the following verse that I'm about to read is the reason why there is very little prophecy or no prophecy in many assemblies. Lots of times I hear people saying, God started the church with you know, prophetic things, Holy Spirit, stuff like that, apostles, prophets. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen anymore. He doesn't want the church to be in that flow anymore because now we have the Bible, the Word, and we shall live by the word alone. And they say, sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And that's, that's the biggest lie that the church has been told. There's very little prophecy, or there is no prophecy, because we cannot despise or make light of something if we desire to operate in it. Whatever you hate, you can't operate in that, in that dimension. And this is where a lot of people wonder why they're poverty stricken. Because you hate rich people. You're suspicious of everybody that's rich. You think that they stole it or they did drugs or something like that. And you have a very strong, ungodly suspicion about people that made their wealth. The rich people that I know, the super rich people that I know, <laughs> when you hear their work schedule, you get scared. They didn't get there easy. Your attitude towards prophecy will determine whether or not you operate strongly in it. And for the most part, where it concerns the church, the church does not have the spirit of prophecy because they have been taught to be skeptical and suspicious of everything that is of a prophetic nature. In the first place, they have no clue what the prophetic nature is because all they think it talks about is predicting. And I showed you the last sit-down we had yesterday, that um, there are six other things that are engaged and involved in the prophetic. And each of them is prophetic and it's prophecy in its own right, in its own way. Six, seven different ways that the prophetic word comes forth, not just predictive alone. And so because of our lack of knowledge in that area, we are one-dimensional which is misunderstanding of the prophetic. And like I said in one of my posts, misunderstanding is considered lack of knowledge. It's just as if you didn't know. If what you know is not right, it's like if you don't know. That's how the spirit world considers it. If you don't have a, a biblical balanced understanding of a subject matter, you are ignorant of that subject matter. That's how the spirit world calculates it. We calculate it as limited knowledge, 10%, 25%, but not in the spirit realm. And for the most part, 90 plus a high percentage of the church think of prophecy as predicting something. And if you listened last night, you would know that... Uh, there are many other dimensions of the prophetic. And so they quench, they shut down prophecy because nobody's going to predict anything up in here. Do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 19. Do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies. And then... To answer the question of what is quenching the spirit, how can you quench the spirit, what is despising prophecy, how can you despise prophecy, that's why I like to ask what, why, how, and these questions. Nobody's going to preach to me, and I'm sitting there not understanding what they're saying and shouting amen, no. You've got to break it down fine, preacher man. You've got to break it down so the smallest child can understand what it is that you're talking about, because people misunderstand preachers all the time. Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. He said, this guy's a vampire. I don't want to walk with a maniac like this. He's, he, his elevator doesn't go all the way up to the top floor. I'm not walking with him from then. And no one walked with him after that. None of those guys who misunderstood him. The second time he said, destroy this temple and I'll raise it in three days. He was talking about the temple of his body. He said, you know how many years we took to build that temple? You're going to break it up? This man is a madman. Let's not follow him anymore. And they left. They left because of misunderstanding. And churches, people have 
left, gone their way, come their way because of misunderstanding. Do not quench, suppress, or subdue. That's what quench means. To suppress, press down, or subdue. Put in a handcuff. Except this time you're not putting your knee on its neck. And on that note, I'm not hearing a lot of my white brothers, they ain't saying nothing. Because when it comes to church, the white ministers like to have blacks in the pew attending. And uh, there are two things that are important. One is your attendance. And the other one is your tithe. Those two are important. Anything else is of no importance to them. You can die. They're not going to say anything because they might offend the white brethren that go to church. Sunday morning between 11 and 1 o'clock is the most segregated time in the history of the world. So black attendance matters and black tithes matters. But nothing else. Their lives don't matter. If they die, we get another joker like them to come fill the pew. They don't care. I just fired a shot right there. Do not quench, suppress, or subdue the Holy Spirit. Do not spurn, spurn, scorn the gifts and utterances of the prophets. Don't, don't scorn. Yeah, yeah, let them try with that. I'm not buying into that mess. They call prophecy a mess. Do not depreciate. Lessen the value of prophecy, prophetic revelations, nor despise inspired instruction or exhortation or warning. Do not despise inspired instruction or exhortation or warning. The church hates instruction. They hate exhortation. And warning, you're in major trouble. You're the falsest of all false prophets. If you give any warning to church folk, they don't want to hear it. They want you to prophesy smooth things. I see a Mercedes Benz uh, driving up your driveway. It's black and it's got a ribbon tied around it, my brother. If you give me a thousand dollars right now, the Lord will loose. He will loose. He will loose, 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 loose. And the music strikes up. They start to clap and dance. Black church has got too much dancing, too much spinning, too much running around. And too much ignorance. You heard me. The black church has got too much dancing. Too much shouting. Too much spinning. And too much running around. And too much laryngitis too. All that screaming and shouting. And very little knowledge is there. Very little teaching takes place. Our people are not solid. They are always broke. Begging. Never looking to make a progress with their life. Vexed with other people for making progress. And have the nerve. To be angry when a preacher tells them black churches dance too much and learn too little. When I know something new, then I'll dance. When you're preaching some truth, then I'll say an amen. But until you inspire my intellect and my spirit, man, I'm not saying nothing. I'm not jumping with everybody else. I'm not shouting and running around the church for no good reason. I'm not shouting no hallelujah either. We hallelujah too much. We amen too much and we learn too little. Put something in your brain when you go to the house of God. You're supposed to learn something. All right. Quench not the Holy Spirit and do not despise prophecies. I'm talking about uh, not quenching the Spirit. The way the Spirit operates in terms of the prophetic and not quenching the Spirit. And this sit down now is like about number 30. 30 times I've sat down. 45 minutes, an hour and a little bit. To talk on this subject of prophets, prophecy, the prophetic, apostles, apostolicity, ya ya re re. And if you were paying attention by now, you would have picked up at least one or two points. I know you know the rest, but hey, I'm just reminding you of what you already know. Do not suppress the spirit and don't brush off spirit-inspired messages. Don't brush it off. I got 99 problems and prophecy ain't one. Hit me. Don't stop the work of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is a work of the Holy Spirit. Don't treat prophecy like something that is not important. Isn't that how church treat prophecy? Like it's something that is not important. Do not hold back the work of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is a work of the Holy Spirit. And you're holding it back by your suspicion, by your whatever. 
Do not treat prophecy as if it were unimportant. I'm reading you all a different translation. I'm at the NIV now. Do not quench the spirit and do not treat prophecies with contempt. Like contempt of court. The judge said you can't be within 50 yards of that person. And you're passing them six feet, six feet away for COVID-19 every single day. So you're 44 feet too close to that person. You, you don't respect the court order. You throw it behind your shoulder like a certain person who was snuck into the presidency a, a few years back in this country and nobody knew except those who were in the inner circle threw away the court order. That's contempt. And people throw away prophecy with contempt. They don't want to hear from God. They don't care about the word of the Lord. I'm not talking about no fake prophecy here. I'm talking about the genuine stuff. This is the Phillips translation. This is how Phillips says it. Never damp the fire of the Spirit. To quench prophecy is to throw water on fire. Never damp the fire of the Spirit. And never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. Never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. I'm talking true prophets and true prophecies here now. Never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. The Message Bible, this is how it says it. Don't suppress the spirit and don't stifle those who have a word from the master. Stifle means to put your hand on their mouth to prevent them from saying anything. There are preachers that do that. Uh, there are preachers who are in charge of churches. And if the Lord begins to use somebody in that congregation in terms of the prophetic aspect of ministry, some preachers are so intimidated and scared of the person's gift they will tell you to shut, shut up. They will put the deacons to take you outside. Or they'll drag you off in an office somewhere, shut the door, and tell you you're disturbing the service. They call the Holy Spirit's prophetic word disturbing the service. You're a disturbance. And they let you know in not so many ways that they prefer if you don't come back to this church. Never damp the fire of the Spirit and never despise what is spoken in the name of the Lord. The Message Bible, don't suppress the spirit. Don't stifle those who have a word from the master. The Voice Bible, don't suppress the spirit and don't downplay prophecies. One man said, you sure the Lord told you that? You sure the Lord told you that? With such arrogance as though because the Lord didn't tell his people, his organization, his denomination, then it can't be true. There are people who, unless the Lord is speaking through their denominational guy or gal, that word is not going to be received well. It's not going to be received anyhow. And they'll sit down in their wrong table and crit critique it from head to toe, critique it up and down and sideways, and come up with a conclusion that says, let's throw it out. It's of no importance to us. And then when it does come to pass, they say, oh, that was just a fluke. You know, somebody else said that. 75 years ago. That's why it came to pass. Do not smother the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at those who prophesy. Do not smother. It's like getting a wet blanket and throwing it on top of somebody's face and then jumping on their face and pressing down where their nasal cavity is. You are choking off the wind. You are choking them off. You're smothering uh, their, 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 their ear duct. You're, you're putting your knee on their neck. And when they say, I can't breathe, you're, you're putting your hand in your pocket and grinding them in the neck until they stop breathing, they stop living. Do not scoff at those who prophesy. Do not scoff. To scoff is to take lightly and to mock in the presence of other people. And, and the Lord is saying through all of these uh, different renditions, quench not the Holy Spirit and do not despise prophesying. Don't forget, Joel said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy in the latter times. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to be aware that in these days we are going to have an abundance of the prophetic anointing upon the church. Not less, more. I will pour out, not drizzle, not drip. I will pour out my spirit. All flesh upon male, female, young, old, even the children will see and hear from God. What are you going to do when that starts happening? Shut everybody up. The Lord has spoken. The lion has roared. Who will not be afraid? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? 
You cannot put limitations on God to tell him, use our denominational heads, use our denominational toes, use our denom denominational nose. We don't want you to use this guy over here or this gal over here. Use our people alone. No, you can't tell God what to do. And some churches, when they say, let's hear the prophecy and let's judge it before you speak to the congregation, you got to tell the, the deacon, the deacon got to take it to the deacon board, the deacon board got to take it to the assistant pastor. If he likes it, he'll tell it to the pastor. If he likes it, then you can come. If not, some deacon shuts it down from scratch, not knowing that this is what the Lord really wanted to do. But you have to pass up so many ungodly people who are in the church that it never gets hurt. The church is full of ungodly people. The preachers are ungodly today. What about the brethren? Stuff that's happening now in church. When I was coming up in church, it never happened. When you hear of a pastor involved in some nefarious behavior, it was a shocker. And it happened like once every 15, 20 years. Now it's every week. Some joker in ministry doing some crazy thing somewhere. There's just too much wickedness in the house. No wonder the Lord allowed this thing to come to shut down all them buildings. Now you're going to see the real church. And you can tell that they weren't really serving God because the next week nobody tithed. You mean they believe in tithing all, this, all these years and all of a sudden in one week, everybody stopped tithing? Yes. They stopped being faithful to God. One week of COVID-19. And lots of preachers have said when, when the thing opens back, they can't go back to church because they are behind in their bills and they can't catch up. They're going to have to close the, the ministry down. You tell me all these people believed in God when things were okay? Yes, but now it's not hunky-dory they don't believe in God no more. That's what I'm telling you. Their faith failed in the day of trouble. If you can't run with the footmen, how are you going to contend with horses? If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Oh, rock a shocker right there. I'm still about going to challenge the church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the whole body of Christ. Everybody and their mother. Because the cry has gone up from heaven concerning the unfaithfulness of God's people. They faithfully listen to these doctors who don't know what they're talking about. When this thing broke, they said, it's not contagious. It cannot be airborne. You can be within three feet of somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah. You've got to be six feet now. You're going to take two weeks. It's not going to kill anybody. Da, 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 de, da. And then as people died and stuff, got, they made it up as they went along. But we obeyed every command they gave. Shut down the building. Isolate the thing. Shut down the airport. Wear masks. Breathe in the mask. Run around with the mask. Da, 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 de, da, 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 da. COVID, uh, social distancing. Ra, ra, ra. We obeyed everything that men who did not know what they were talking about said. And in the process of trial and error and tens of thousands of people dying, they finally know some more than when they started off lying to us. But we believe those men and we do everything they tell us. And here's a God who has been faithful to us from day one to now. And the first thing we dumped was God. The first thing we dumped was our faith. The first thing we dumped was our obedience to God. We obey men rather than we obey God. People wouldn't go outside without a mask. People wouldn't go nowhere without a mask. But they'll go now without faithfulness to God and expect blessings to come on their life. I don't know what happened to the church. This COVID-19 has shown that Christianity is inoculated with a lot of weak-willed people who don't really trust God when the rubber hits the road. If, if push comes to shove, they will deny Jesus and say, I never knew that man. Give me 30 pieces of silver. I'll sell him out tomorrow if you give me enough money. Oh, rock a shocker right there. The English word despise was translated from the Greek word exotheneo, E X O U T H E N E O, exotheneo, which means to make of no account, to despise utterly. It means it's something like scorn. You scorn this thing, to, to despise utterly, much like. 
uh, some of our brethren despise black people. They despise them utterly. They're no good. They're, they're, they, can't, uh, they can't administrate. They, they can't lead. They, they, nothing good ever comes out of them. They, they can't save. They, they, can't, they, they stink. They stink. I've heard that from people. They think you're lower than monkeys. They really believe that. And you sit around too long, they'll tell you that too. They utterly despise because your pigmentation of skin. To make of no account, to not even bother to count, to take it off the account, I forget that. To utterly despise. The word not only depicts contempt or hatred, but also it could mean to ignore. Don't even, don't even bring it up again. Ignore it. It's like the preacher who said, I'm a big name prophet and I have this big prophetic ministry that globally people know my name. And he is. Google the guy. The guy is a catch meow on the dogs, bow wow. And he said this lady sent him this prophetic word. She said she saw Disney World shut down. Everything shut down tight. Nothing moving. No business happening. And she said, uh, Mr. Prophet Man, I'm not any big name prophet, but the Lord does speak to me in dreams for the last 30 plus years. Whenever the Lord gives me a dream of this nature, something, and she said to him, something big is coming that's going to shut down Disney, shut down a lot of businesses, shut down a lot of sporting events, shut down a lot of, and he said when he read it, he just chucked the letter like, yeah, phew, who does she think she's talking to? If something of that magnitude was going to happen, the Lord will show it to me because the Lord does nothing unless he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. And he'll tell us he must treat it and all that kind of stuff. He didn't bother with her letter. And then when Disney did close and the airports did shut down and businesses did shut down and sporting events did shut down, he searched through the rubbish that he had, the letters he had put aside to, to discard and he found the woman's letter. And he came out on his program, which is very rare. I, it's just the second time in 41 years of church and ministry that I've seen a preacher apologize. In 41 years, preachers don't apologize. It's against their religion. They're never wrong. So they can't say sorry. And he said, I'm so sorry. I could have been of better use in the kingdom even if I didn't endorse our message. The least I could have done was read it out to the public and at least the people would have been warned that something was coming. All I knew was that everything that can be shaken would be shaken, but I didn't see that part that she saw. That's the, that's the problem right there. Let me address it again. The Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. All right? What happens in that prophetic download that is given to that woman, that part of Disney World being shut down and sporting events being shut down and businesses and airports being shut down, that was her part to see. She saw a part of it. She did not see all of the economic woes and all of the suspicion among nations and people dying and falling on the street. She did not see that. The prophet in that part of the world, in Europe now, that's where he's from, he saw everything that can be shaken, would be shaken, but he could not make the connection, what is it that's going to be shaken? Everything, he, he said in his wildest imagination, he never thought that it meant everything, but he kept hearing it in the spirit. Everything will be shaken. Every, I'm going to shake everything. Had he put the woman's revelation that she saw, Disney World shut down, sporting events shut down, airports shut down, businesses shut down, with everything that can be shaken, will be shaken. All right, so here you go. The business world will be shaken. The sporting world will be shaken. Disney World, which is an international place of people, tourists visit, tourism will be shaken. Whatever it is that's coming is going to shake the whole world of business. The whole, you know, I'm saying he could have put two and two together, but no, she's a woman. What does she know? I'm the prophet around here. I didn't see that, therefore, that is not valid. The part that he saw that everything that can be shaken would be shaken, that part came to pass. The part that she saw, Disney World shut down, business, sporting events, and airports shut down, that was her part to see. What he saw was right. 
what she saw was right. When you connect the two of them, you get a bigger picture. The part that she saw was not his part to see, and the part that he saw was not her part to see. And this is why we need each other, because your part to see, I don't see that. My part that I see, you may not get to see that. I'm not a false prophet because you didn't see what I saw. You're not a false prophet because I didn't see what you saw. We see in part. It's when we join the parts that we get the whole for God's sake. But no, especially if this person is not, he's not assemblies of God. He's not full gospel. He's not New Testament. He's not Pentecostal. He's not Baptist. So we don't listen to people because they're not from our organization. What are you going to do with me? I'm independent now. What is, what's going to happen to me now? Well, the independent people, they're a bunch of rebels. Just throw them to the wolves. They, they don't even know what they did. They don't like to submit to authority. People throw that at you all the time. And you submit to authority and all you get is drama. And the worse leading, the better. When you get tired of wicked leadership, you'll get independent. You trust me on that. Don't set at naught something because it didn't come through your favorite preacher. Some of you have your favorite preacher. I know I'm never going to be some people's favorite preacher because I don't have time to play the games. I don't have time to be politically correct. I don't have time to uh, tip through the tulips and, and, and to say things that will make everybody please. I can do it. I can preach to get amens and get shouts. Look, if I decide tomorrow I can make you like me, I don't care who it is, I don't care how you hate me, I can make you like me by just telling you all the nice things. And the Bible has enough good news for the rest of my life. I can just tell you all the nice, sweet things and get you to like me and be telling the truth. But I don't balance it with the other side of judgment coming and that kind of stuff. I leave that for the other prophets of doom. And I just preach nice, smiling, lovely, shouting, blessing sermon. You will like me, but what kind of a preacher will I be? I'll be just like a prostitute. Just pretending. I've got to tell you the whole counsel of God. Paul said, I did not fail to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He said, well, you always declare the bad side. No, I've got so much good news on my place, man. It's just once in a while. And when I'm dealing with a subject, I like to get into the bone, the marrow of that subject, so that at least the people that listen to this voice, they will have a better understanding of the subject matter until the Lord gives clarity. Another teacher comes along and they get to to understand more but you're not going to be ignorant when i teach a subject i'm going to find things and listen to other people and use some of their notes and join with some of my notes and ask the holy spirit for interpretation and download some revelation i'm going to hear when you tell me about this and listen to this other one over here i'm the product of a whole lot of people's wisdom i listen to everybody some of it is not good i spit it out it's good i keep that part Sometimes I spit it out, I got to go back and pick it up. Come on, you, you got some marrow left in you. <laughs> Glory to God. Mm. To set at naught, to ignore, to see as little. Luke 23, 11, Acts 4, 11, Romans 14, 10. Paul's admonition in 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 is to not hate, to not dislike, to not ignore prophecy. He admonished them not to hate prophecy, not to dislike, and not to ignore. Why? Because people have a tendency of hating prophecy, disliking the prophetic, and ignoring a prophetic word. They just have that tendency. They want to hear bless, bless all the time. Just bless, bless. Just bless, bless. All the time. Just bless, bless. Just bless, bless. All the time. 1 Peter 4 and 11 says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone serves, let him serve with the strength that God supplies, so that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise, dominion forever and ever. So one is doing the speaking, another is doing the serving, but both are necessary. You know, when you serve too much in church, people have the tendency of thinking you are a, you're a, a, a semi-janitor. You're on the janitorial staff. And they treat you like that. Meaning, they don't think you have any level of intellect, any level of intelligence. That's why you're sweeping the church. I have swept many a church. I've vacuumed many a church. And if I go in a building and something needs to be cleaned, something needs to be done, piece of garbage on the floor, I don't wait for no cleaner to come. 
I am there. God's got hands. He's got my hands. And then I go wash my hands. He said, but you're the reverend. You can't uh, pick up garbage. Of course you can. There's no reverend who should not be able to pick up some garbage in the house of God. The devil is a liar. We have gotten this thing so messed up that preachers, all they want to do now is walk in, preach, and walk out. They want to greet the people. They hate the sheep, but they love the wool. They hate the sheep, but they love the mutton. I know what I'm talking about, man. When we speak as the oracles of God, and minister with the ability that God has given us, and we have different levels of ability, God is glorified. God is glorified through our ministering. People will praise and glorify God for the breakthroughs released in their lives through His Word. Prophecy. It means to speak on the behalf of another. That person becomes a voice for God. They become the oracles of God. They become the mouthpiece of God. The Lord said, I will put my word in your mouth. It's my word, but it's your mouth. You got to mouth it. You can't shut it down or allow people to shut you down. People shut you down with a stink eye. They know that the Lord will use you. And they give you the look that says, you better shut up. And if you do not shut up, I will not give you any amen. And I've got my crew here with me. I just give them. <laughs> I was in a church. And uh, this lady, when I walked in, she gave me a stink eye. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So I don't know her. She doesn't know me. What is that about? So I went my merry way, sat in the front. And when it was time to minister the word, I got up there, read my scripture. And she was bobbing her head, moving her head to let me know that she was watching me. She wanted to catch my attention. So I looked at her and she didn't say it in words, but she said it with her facial expression that you're not going to go far in this message here. And while I was looking at her, she looked at some different people in the thing and she gave them a nod as if wait for the signal. I preach for five minutes, nothing. Ten minutes, nothing. 15 minutes, nothing. <coughs> and then she looked around at them and gave them a signal as if, okay, I have, I have shown him who run this stuff here. Now if you want to tell him an amen here and there, you can give him an amen. Here. But I have established with him that I run this show. <laughs> oh, she was bad. We say it in, in, in my country there. She was bad for days. She let me know that she was the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. And unless she released those people, ain't not one of them saying any amen. And not one of them did. She had the place locked. <laughs> Some people let you know that they have the power. They let you. They show you in different ways. I run this show. You're not going to say anything that I don't like. Are you feeling a brother? You are speaking on behalf of another. They don't want to hear it and they let you know. So the person who prophesies, they're speaking for another. And they ought to do it with conviction. You have to be convinced that you are doing this and you're speaking on the behalf of God. That's why I don't get scared of people. I don't care what stink eye they give or sweet eye. I don't care. I'm here to deliver a message from the Lord. I know I've got a word from God. I am not scared of you, your mother, and all your in-laws. Bring it on. If you want some, come get some. You better be willing to take some. I am not Mr. Nice Guy Preacher. You want to confront, come on. But you better be ready for it because I'm not going to take it lying down. I get hit, I hit back. Boom, shaka laka. Say, well, what kind of reverend is that? That's the kind of reverend you're coming up against. Name of Jesus. The violent take it by force. I'm that kind of reverend. <laughs> <sighs> Lord, I'm, I'm having fun right now. The Apostle Peter's words in Scripture when he exhorts us to speak as the oracles of God in 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. An oracle is a mouthpiece. Just like a lawyer is a mouthpiece for his client. One who speaks as the oracle of God, the person who prophesies, they serve as the mouthpiece for God. You are what God would have said had God been there. This is what God would have said 
had he had your personality and vocabulary and everything else. We are not ministering to bring glory to ourselves, but we minister to bring glory to God. This is our attitude. This is my attitude towards ministry. I'm not trying to be uh, Mr. Popular, and I'm certainly not a pain seeker. If I can go without having any fights for the rest of my life, to God be the glory. But I'm not going to water down God's word just to please anybody. You don't like to hear what the Lord is saying, then that's all right. You want to make a big issue about it, that's all right too. But if you want some, if you're feeling froggy, then jump. And don't be shocked when you get what you get. Name of Jesus. Worship now. Worship, I just jumped off from that threatening stuff. Is one of the areas that is greatly impacted when the prophetic gift is activated. Worship. Prophets that don't worship God, I seriously doubt the quality and caliber and genuineness of their prophetic grace and anointing. I doubt whether they have any prophecy happening there. They may be a soothsayer, but not a prophet. In 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 25, the Bible says, He set the Levites at the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, lyres, according to the commandment of David, and God the seer. Now, you know who a seer is because I explained that earlier on. The king, the seer of the king, and Nathan the prophet, for the commandment came from the Lord through his prophets. The Lord didn't boom it down from heaven. He gave it through his prophets. Why God does it, I don't know. Because God can talk for himself. The man said, Father Abraham, send, send the prophets. Let them go tell my brothers. I don't want them to come to this place. Abraham said, they have the prophets down there. Let them hear them. That's the way God set up the system. You've got to believe men. You've got to listen to men. Why, I don't know. But that's the way the system is set. If you don't believe men, you will not hear from God. Because God speaks through men. <sighs> You now have to discern. Israel's worship was established by prophets. Prophets establish worship. <laughs> Hezekiah re-established this worship based on the commandment of David, God, and Nathan. There is a strong connection between worship and the prophetic ministry. A prophetic ministry that has no worship is no prophetic ministry. Prophets should be instrumental in worship. They should be involved, the prophets, should be involved as musicians, as singers, as seers, as dancers. David established worship on Mount Zion with the prophetic family of Asaph, Heman, and Jedotun, 1 Chronicles 25. Heman was the king's seer. He was the king's go-to man when he wanted to hear what God was saying. The prophetic level in Israel at the time was extremely high because of the ministry of Samuel and the school of the prophets that Samuel had raised up. Music was evidently used in training the emerging prophets. Bring me a minstrel, one man said. And then when the minstrel played, the Spirit of God came on him. Music and the prophetic and God's anointing came hand in hand. When Saul was insane and unwell and there was a national crisis, somebody told the king's household, that there was a young boy in the desert there playing a harp with such grace and anointing that the power of God would come down because they felt it when they heard him play in the wilderness. The answer to the national crisis was prophetic music played under the anointing. The answer to national crisis. The king was running off his head. That was national crisis. When the leader is mad, you need a, a deliverance anointing to come and yank the, the evil, insane, melancholic spirit that was on the king. And the answer to that nation's trouble was prophetic music. Look at that. We play down the power of music. We play these wild, vulgar songs, and we don't know what we're doing, charging the atmosphere without that level of lust and wickedness. I'm talking about it's just a song. There's no such thing as just a song. Music is the most powerful means of communicating music is the most powerful means of communicating i did an entire six week teaching on that for for six weeks every day half an hour 
to four to five minutes. Music, the power of music. Breaking it down like a fraction. Come on, y'all. <sighs> Elisha called for a minstrel and began to prophesy. Music is very important in worship and in the training of prophetic people. Anointed minstrels help release the prophetic flow. Anointed minstrels, anointed musicians, they help to release the prophetic flow and keep it strong in an assembly. The secrets of God are opened up upon the heart when that music is engaged. Heaven, God inhabits. He comes to, he comes to live, to homestead, to chill out in the presence of praise. Oh, rock a shocker right there. Psalm 49 and 4 says, I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying, my dark saying, my mysterious revelations. I will open them upon the harp. What does that mean? When music is engaged, the things that you don't know, the dark, mysterious Things that you can't understand will begin to unravel. He's giving you a secret of flowing in the prophetic through music. It's not just the music is not just for entertainment. That's why I, 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 I preach so strong against the black church alone. Because only the black church that does this. They play the jumpy jumpy music because they want to dance and show their shots and carry on and, and drop it like it's hot and tweak and twerk and do all the latest dance they see. In the dance hall, including the vulgar ones too. They pop it and lock it and drop it and twiggle it and clap it and all that stuff in the house of God. Now the, the church has become like a place of entertainment. I see some videos people send me with people that dance in front of the church. It's just an attention-getting spirit. It's not under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, the black church dances way too much and learn way too little. You want to be angry with me? That's all right. Saul met a company of prophets who were playing the instrument in 1 Samuel 10. Elisha called for a minstrel and began to prophesy. Music is important in worship and also in the training of prophetic people. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon a harp. Psalm 49 and 4. Oh, glory to God. Yes. Minstrels, musicians, should be spirit-filled, skilled, and consecrated. They should be spirit-filled. Most of them are not. Skillful. Few of them are skillful. Consecrated. You rarely find a consecrated musician. They come in late. They're now tuning up the instrument when the service is supposed to start. They're at the control board, tweaking, 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 disturbing the service all the time, 99% of the time. The most rebellious group of people that I have known over the years are the musicians. They seem to be unable to take instruction. They are usually not consecrated to God. They are always kind of lusty, lusty, lustful, lustful. Rarely sanctified people in the music department. Satan always manages to sneak in two or three crazy lust buckets into the music department because that's where he was good at in heaven and he came to, this, to plant himself into that church to bring destruction. He's, there's always a satanic plant in the music department or in the leadership. Always in the leadership or in the music department or both. Why do musicians feel they can come to church anytime they want to? Why do they feel they can walk in, walk straight up on the stage or wherever and pick up an instrument? Why do they feel that they don't, they don't need to show any respect, regard, or they have very little manners concerning the things of God? And concern the house of God. But they will go to their workplace. And if they are late, they'll call the uh, supervisor and let them know, I'll be a few minutes late. Because if they don't, they'll be fired. But they bring an unprofessional behavior to the house of God. And if you talk to them, they absent themselves and they, they, they sabotage the music by keeping a few cards that they know have to be plugged into something there. And uh, they keep that at home to spoil the whole music system. Because if they are not there, nobody knows how to set it up because they are gone with some critical parts of that. I have seen musicians sabotage services day in, day out, day in, day out. And the music department needs to be consecrated to God because it is one of the places in the church that lacks consecrated people. The music department. 
They are rarely spirit filled, rarely consecrated, and few are skillful. They just know a few cards. They stay on that. They won't try to improve themselves on the playing of the instrument. What they know is what they know, and nobody else knows more than them. And they make sure that nobody else learns to play any instrument because they want to be the cat's meow and the dog's bow wow. And they fight anybody who wants to learn. They keep them away from playing because they want to be the only one who knows to play and wants to play. And that way they can control the church by controlling the music department. There's a lot of control freaks in the house of God. I know I say some hard things sometimes, but I ain't lying. I ain't lying. And had we told the, this, these things that I'm saying now, had we told it to the church earlier on, we wouldn't have these problems that we have now. We would have solved all of this mess. But it is the apostle's job to bring correction. So I'm just doing a brother's job. Minstrels should be spirit-filled, consecrated. They need to work with the singers and dancers to bring forth the song of the Lord. We need prophetic musicians as a part of the worship team. If the members of the worship team are not prophetic, they need to be activated in the prophetic anointing to some degree or another. You can't have people who have no flow in an area of the church that needs people with flow. Your guts to has flow you've got to have flow <laughs> prophetic people are sensitive to the word of the lord the word of the lord can be spoken a eh, or sung what song as in a song as in sang sing sang song song The book of Psalms, all of those things from 1 to 150, they are all songs. We read them for entertainment purposes and for niceties and to hear something pleasant and positive, but they were songs. Say what? The Psalms are songs. Uh, David, a worshiper, was also a prophet. He was known as the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now these are the last words of David. 2 Samuel 23, 1-3. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. He knew that what he was saying was not his thing. People think you just make it up. Some people do, but we're not playing that game before God kill us. We have some fear for God up in here saying things that the Lord didn't say. Opening your mouth, thus said the Lord, the Lord didn't say thus. No, we don't play that game. If the Lord ain't saying nothing, I ain't saying nothing. If the Lord is saying something, but he says, keep that to yourself, I ain't saying nothing. If the Lord is saying something, he says, only tell it to your wife. After I told my wife, I ain't saying nothing else. If the Lord has said something, he said, tell it to your church, to your church and only. I'll tell it to my church and to my church only. When I say my church, you know I don't have no church. And then I'll not say anything. If he says, tell it everywhere you go. You tell it everywhere you go. Sometimes you go to a nation with a word for that nation. The Lord says, I don't want you to tell the nation this word. I want you to tell a particular group. You look at a group, you got three, four people. And you say, Lord, you can do a better job if you tell it on the radio or if you tell it on the television as opposed to three, four people. The Lord says, no, tell it to the three, four people. Next thing you know, two of those people own television and radio station and they go out with the stuff and it's gone virus the woman said she put out the thing and it went virus <laughs> she meant viral you just have to laugh some church got some funny stuff glory to god the god of israel said the spirit of the lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue this is david now in second samuel 23 1 to 3 his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. He that ruleth over men, prime ministers and presidents, they must be just ruling in the fear of God. They can't rule in the fear of God if they don't know God. They can't rule in the fear of God if they're calling some fake God and saying this God, this Lord, bless this whole community here they don't know what they're talking about and they're surrounded by preachers who know better 
and then the people of the north to call the man a Christian. Everything is Christian today. You can't be an idol worshiper and be a Christian at the same time. Christ and uh, idols don't go together. Christ and false gods don't go together. Jesus thundered it to his people. I am the way. The only one way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And that song very self-serving and boastful. I am Alpha and Omega. Look, when Jesus stood up to talk, he said some things that were beyond the range of human calculation and understanding. And he was not lying. Leaders are to rule in the fear of God. 99% of our leaders around the world, they don't even know God. They don't care about God. They have no fear for God. That's why they can craft the laws that they craft to suppress and to oppress the people and keep them poor. And then to tell the nation in the face of a blatant first degree murder that there may, may be charges filed. There may be charges filed. Here's a guy who's screaming that he's dying and there may be charges filed. Here's a guy who shot nine people in a church and the police came there and put a nice little handcuff on his hand and walked him out very nicely. Uh, you have a right to remain silent. Everything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. Read him his Miranda rights and walked him out nicely, gingerly, quietly. No rough treatment. Here's a supposed crime that not even proven but you kill him and we're supposed to be okay with that no i warn this world the chickens will come home to roost and you're not going to like the roost that you see there is going to be a backlash and what we're seeing now is minor compared to what's coming you cannot do this to people for generations and they will just take it lying down David is called the sweet singer of Israel. Sweet in the Hebrew is Naim, N-A-I-Y-M, Naim. It means pleasant. It means delightful. It means sweet. It means lovely. It means agreeable. It means delightful. It means beautiful. Beautiful to look upon physically. It means singing sweetly sounding. It means musical. It means pleasing sounds. David was a singing prophet, but he was also a musical prophet. Musical prophets bring great blessing and refreshing to the church. And they should be identified, A, and released. They are an important part of true worship. They release the word of the Lord in song. Habakkuk released the word of the Lord. Upon Shigionoth in Habakkuk 3 and 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon Shigionoth. The World English Bible translates the verse as a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet set to victorious music. Oh, there you go. Set. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet set to victorious music. I've got a song out there that came to me. In the British Virgin Islands, we had just finished church and the musician was running his uh, hands across the keyboard because he knew that every now and then a brother got some flow. And the flow hit me and I took up the microphone and for the next 10 minutes, this song came. And uh, I got a call about a year and a half later from this family and they said they had this demon possessed sister, aunt, whatever. In the family and the person was coming over to their home if there was anything that i could do in terms of trying to get across to them and pray when this person is there and it hit me right on the spot i said i want i'm going to send you a song i want you to play it when this person comes into the house that's what came to me here in canada tell them to play this song don't play too loud just play this song so i thought a song I could send a prayer, you know, a dynamic, pounding, devil-chasing prayer. Send the song, son. I was disappointed in God. Like, God, come on. We could do heavier than a song. We could send a prayer, a, a, a spiritual warfare prayer. Son, I said, all right, all right, all right. And so I sent the song to them. And they, 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 they were disappointed. They said, Rev, you sure? I said, yes, I, I think. I think the Lord is wanting me to tell you to play this song. 
He said, all right, if you think the Lord is thing, then we think the Lord is thing too. Okay. And I didn't hear from them again about two weeks later. He said, guess what? When the person came into the house, they made sure to lock the door and everything else. And they, they turned the song on and began to play. And the individual who they thought was possessed, demonized, turned around put their hand to their ear, fell on the ground, and started to puke, to vomit, 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 all kinds of colors. The stench was filling the house. And when they were done, they got up, went into the washroom, washed their face, washed their mouth, got rid of stuff. And the individual was back in their right mind asking them in the house, what happened? What's that smell? A song that was given by the Lord is exercising demonic power in another nation thousands of miles away. Just the words that were given by the Holy Spirit. God knows how to deliver the righteous from every situation. A song from the Lord did that. David played and the devil left King Saul. He was refreshed. He was in his right mind and he was well, which meant he was sick. He had lost his mind. And he was stressed out. That's why he needed to be refreshed. These three things came when music was engaged. The power of heaven was engaged. And released upon a monarch who had gone possessed and psyched out. There was a national crisis. And the answer, the solution to the national crisis was prophetic music played by David, the prophet of God. Who prophesied upon his harp and brought deliverance to King Saul. Oh, the music department, the worship people, they're dangerous in that house of God. If they know who they are, if they know why they're there, they are to escort the presence of God. Much like the children of Israel had the Ark of the Covenant that was indicative and a representation of the presence of God. They marched in front and led the people. Yeah? That, the, 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 the worship leaders, they are carriers of the presence of God. They are ushers of the presence of God. They are ushering in the presence of God to the people. They are not there to show us how sweet they can sing and how they can move their body and shake their hips and all that kind of stuff. They are there to escort the presence of God. They are there to bring the presence of God by their worship. God inhabits the praise. He comes to engage with his people as they praise him. And his presence is released among us. The presence of the Lord is released among us. The devil is pushed back. Saul was refreshed and the demons left him. Oh, I feel a preacher's anointing coming on me right now. Oh, glory to God. <coughs> glory to God. What can I say but glory to God, man? The Lord sent the word and great is the company of them that proclaimed it. Musical prophets bring great blessing and refreshing to the house of God. There's nothing like a song that's born and birthed by the Holy Spirit coming to the church extemporaneously the people know that this song never existed before and yet when they hear it the, the ability of God to give a song and to cause the musician to play in the right chord and to give the lyrics and the word and the beat and the rhythm to the singer all of that downloaded from heaven instantaneously extemporaneously titillating music vibrant powerful devil chasing music released by the sovereign God only God can do something like that only God can do something like that. Only God. The Bible says he gives songs in the night. In your darkest hour, your greatest song will be born. I will not be shocked when this COVID mess is done. The amount of songs that will come forth in praise to God. That is earth shaking and devil chasing music. Music with meaning. Not the fluff. But you can't get fluff in tough times. Tough times... Bring out the lion in you. Oh, let the lion loose. Let the lion roar. Who can but prophesy? They release the word of the Lord in song. Prophecy put to music. Habakkuk released the word to Shigio North in Habakkuk 3 and verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet set to victorious music to prophesy means to speak or to sing by inspiration we we don't we don't care about the aspect that song has in inspiration and prophecy but there is a musical aspect to prophecy as well 
Now, all we know about in terms of prophecy is the predictive nature of prophecy. Thus said the Lord, next week, this time, thus and thus will happen. That's all we know. But I'm telling you now, prophecy has a very strong, a very high element of musicality involved in it. And this, this is often spontaneous. The music that comes, it's spontaneous. You don't sit down home and decide, I'm going to write a song. The song is written in heaven and downloaded to you. You know how many songs are in heaven that God should have downloaded to us a long time ago, but we're not allowing him to flow in terms of the music. We see music as being jumpy, jumpy. We dance a little bit to get us going, get the blood pumping before we get the offering, before we get the preacher. Talk about the most important part of the service is the preacher. The most important part of the service is not the preacher. The most important part of the service is the worship of God. Because if the preacher preaches until the cows come home, if the presence of God does not come, we did not have church. We had a nice social club, a nice motivational speech, speech, and then we went home. Lots of what passes for church is not church because God never came. Man came. All the flesh was on parade, but very little God. To prophesy simply means to speak or sing by inspiration. This is often spontaneous and comes as the anointing flows from within or it rests upon. The musician can play, pray, and sing by inspiration. Oh God, we don't have these kinds of musicians very often in the church. We got lots of showmanship. We got lots of flesh on parade showing off and showmanship. We got a lot of people turning their instrument up higher than the other one. It's like a satanic display of competitive jealousy. The musician can play, pray, sing by inspiration. And then when they are inspired, we are inspired. Inspiration is powerful when it is released in worship. When you get that inspiration, when it hits you. When you sing a song to the Lord spontaneously it never that song never existed before but as you're engaged in worship the prince of god hits you and the music that heaven has a musical a, a, a whole dimension of musicians and musical side and worshipers up there and they have songs that they can't sing because they don't know about redemption they don't know about what it is to be washed in the blood of jesus the bible said angels wish they could they could peer into these things and they they look at one another and wonder what is man that god is mindful of him why is jehovah's mind full of this little weak creature down there and we are up here with all this power all this thing and he is his mind is full of them he's mind full of them his mind is full of them his mind is not full of us angels up here there's an entire musical section in heaven lucifer used to be the man in charge but he left he got kicked out he got fired for trying to usurp the authority of God. Musicians love to usurp authority. The first one did it. No wonder they are like that mostly. The musician can play, sing, and play under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when they are inspired, we are inspired because people inspire people. Inspiration is very powerful when it is released in worship. The first place we see the word prophet in the Bible is in Genesis 20 and verse number 7. And it is used to describe Abraham. He is called an inspired man, a prophet, one who speaks or sings by inspiration. Prophecy was not only speech. It was also lyrical, musical, rhythmical. Oh, yeah. Drip, drop. Drop, drip. <sighs> He was called an inspired man, a prophet, one who speaks or sings by inspiration. Inspiration is a result of the breath of God, the wind of God, the ruah, hey, the ah, serai, serah, Abraham, Abraham, ah, the breath. And that breath put life in Abraham's dead body and Sarah's dead womb. When you engage with the breath of God, you're engaged with the life of God. Life comes. The music has life to it. It brings life to people. Moses desired that all of God's people were prophets, that all of God's people would be inspired to speak and to sing 
in Numbers 11 and 29. Would to God that all of God's people were prophets, that they all had this, this, this musical side to them, that they could raise a song to the great Jehovah. Hopefully, musicians will hear this message and not take uh, offense. But they'll take some advice from the scripture and sit together and pray. And play. And hand somebody the microphone and tell them, sing what you hear from the Lord. You've got to be especially daft, deaf, and having no musical bone in your body to be unable to come up with a chord of a song that the Lord will give to you because he gives songs. The Lord has quintillions of songs that have never been sung and he wants to give you one. Just one. One is enough. The woman said I was in the shower. I was having a bad day. I was not doing too well. My career was stalled. And suddenly I heard the words of a song coming to me as clear as a bell. And the words were, Take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. I just want to praise him. I just want to praise him. And she said, I ran out of the shower and I got my sister and in a short time the song came. And when it dropped, it went around the world like a tsunami. And that one song, I will live a blessed life for the rest of my life. Because I was able to download that one song. It gave me popularity, stardom, superstardom. People call for me all over the place. Me and my sister, we go and sing different songs now. But that was the song that gave me notoriety. God can give you a song. A beat, a word that can move you from obscurity to international stardom. I saw a prophet from Africa last year. It was a replay that I saw this year, but he was giving the word last year. And he said he saw a virus. In a place by the sea. It's going to kill a lot of people. And go across the world. The church was to pray. Because if they don't. Millions of people will die. And then the clincher. He says this virus. Is coming from China. From China. He said it over and over and over. What does that have to do with anything? Well. When the virus did hit and they found out where it was from, Wuhan, and found out that it was a seaport and found out that it was in China, somebody reminded the church about what the pastor was saying on the day when they all thought he had lost his mind and talking about this virus that's going to shut down the world, blah, 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 blah. And it was coming from China. And they played what he had said in 2019 earlier. And he had even said it the year before that, something similar. But last year, he added more to what he had seen before. And the television stations all across the globe, they're calling for this man. He's the hottest thing now on, on television. His name is known across the globe because he had received a word from God. He had given it to the church. They had forgotten about it. And when the corona hit, they re revived the tape, brought the tape out to show that this man had indicated this thing was coming uh, a year and two years before it actually hit. And his name is the most popular name now in the, in the prophetic world and across the globe. Nobody knew about him. Very few people across the globe had heard about him. That one word from God brought him superstardom status in terms of ministry. Now, he's not looking for that. And you could tell that he's not uh, very comfortable with all this attention He's constantly sending the glory back to God, which is what should happen. But that one word brought him into notoriety, brought him into popularity, moving out of obscurity. God can do something like that for you, and may he do it this day, today, today. May God give you a word that will shake the world. May God give you a word that is so accurate 
that when it comes to pass, even your greatest hater will love Jesus because of you and will come to a, 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 the saving knowledge of the Lord and come to walk with the Lord. May your name be forever etched in me memorial as one of the greats who heard from God. In the name of Jesus, may God use you. May God use you. May God use you. There, there was a Calypsonian in, back in the day named Crazy. Crazy, I don't know why you love me so. Crazy, you're sweeter than a ripe mango. And Crazy did a song. He says, one day America will have a black president. And the Pope will come from Latin America. One day. This man is no prophet. Fidel Castro back in the day said the same thing. He said one day America would have a black president. Castro is no prophet. But God can give information and insight and clarity to people that will listen for him and listen to him. Look, God can speak through a donkey. What else is new? God can get you the taxes through a fish's mouth. What else is new? God can use a carrion crow to bring bread and flesh. And you know carrion crow don't deal with stuff that's fresh. They deal with rotten stuff and yet god used them reverse their nature and bless the world with messages that we know now god can use anything anyone anywhere anybody you can be one of them that god would use and i'm telling you that whatever god can give to you can be so great that people will never take you for granted ever again there are people that send messages all the time what is the Lord saying? I said, well, he hasn't said anything to me for whatever, a couple of days ago. No, what's the last thing you heard? You sure you want to hear? Yeah. These are people that were laughing back in 2014. And when the things started coming to pass one after the next, they started calling now instead of laughing. But they called privately. They send messages, but they send them privately. They don't want nobody to know. All of a sudden, they know the word of the Lord is in your mouth, and they want to hear what thus said the Lord. And they say, you know, don't tell anybody, but um, what is the Lord saying? And they go to their church and tell them what the Lord is saying. And they, when the people see it come to pass, they say, oh, pastor, you've got a prophetic anointing. You don't know how greatly the Lord can use you. But I'm telling you, it's that time in the, in the world's history where from obscurity God will bring people and use them on the global scale. And these are unknowns. He will raise up the poor from the dunghill and give them a place among the princes of the earth. Lord, I pray for a tremendous release of revelation. The spirit of prophecy come upon the people. Grant them songs that they never sang before, never heard before. Open up their spirits to be responsive to the voice of God. <sighs> blow out the stale air of satanic oppression. Let a fresh wind of Pentecost blow their way. Give them insight into the things of God. <laughs> In Jesus' mighty name I have prayed. Thank you for watching. May the spirit of prophecy come on you. May you see things you never saw, hear things you never heard, and become the oracles of God and speak as the messenger of God. So let it be. Selah.